Moving on to our next session, and it's our sixth speaker slot, um, and it's a great treat in store. We're really, really fortunate today to have two phenomenal women here to talk to you about the UK's hottest topic right now. I'd like to introduce the Information Commissioner, Elizabeth Denham, together with Fidel Magood, who has recently joined PwC as a director. And these ladies are going to talk to you about GDPR and so much more. Please welcome, welcome them to the stage. Wow, fantastic room. Is everyone having a good time? Yes. I didn't, not sure I quite heard that. <laughs> I didn't hear it. A good time. Yeah. Yes. There we go, they are alive. <laughs> good stuff. Fidelma, I was thinking that I've seen you on platforms before, but I believe that we met only about a year ago it seems, though, a lot longer. Do you remember? I do, I do. That was September 2016, uh, the Personal Information Economy uh, event. And if memory serves me rightly, I'm pretty sure that was your first public speaking in your new role. I think it was. It was September 2016. It was my maiden speech as the new and shiny information commissioner of the United <laughs> Kingdom, and I'm not so shiny anymore. <laughs> um, so we were on a panel, and there were some other speakers, and Liz Brandt was the moderator. Is that right? That is it. And you know what? Actually, as I look here with a room full of fantastic women all engaged in data, that was an incredible time. Do you remember the tweet we got? Um, we had, for the first time, a panel of all women, and someone tweeted, fantastic four women. Yeah, a, a regulator, an entrepreneur, a business person, and a, 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 and a, thought, a leader. thought leader. Thought leader, thank you, yeah. And that was really impressive. And how the future has unfolded. Okay. How it has, how it has. But you know what I remember about that? I remember about the joke that you told. Oh, Liz. You know the joke that you told about the chauffeur and the lecturing professor? <laughs> I think that's an appropriate joke to share with this room today. It's time for a joke, right? It's time for a joke. Do you mind telling that joke? Uh, Liz, my family made me promise I wouldn't tell a joke in public. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but if you can't trust the privacy commissioner, then who can you trust? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> Would you like to hear the joke I told Liz a year ago? Okay. So uh, the reason I, I told Liz this was that she, in her role, obviously was on her maiden speech, but she was preparing to go and, as we have seen, present at many other organizations. So I was telling her about a lecturing professor that I had heard about. And this professor toured the country giving a lecture on his specialist topic. And he had a chauffeur who traveled with him to take him from venue to venue. And they were traveling to one of the venues one evening and the professor said to the chauffeur, John, you've heard this so much. I reckon you could deliver this presentation just as well as I could. And the chauffeur said, I reckon I could. So they swapped places. And the chauffeur did a brilliant job. Yeah, delivered word perfect. And it came to the Q&A session. And a question came up that had never been asked before. So the chauffeur looked at the guy who asked the question and he said, I cannot believe you've asked me that. It's so simple, my chauffeur could answer it. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great one. <laughs> Just don't tell my family, OK? Nope. Promise, promise. You pulled um, it off. <laughs> um, are we a bit frivolous here? It's we a little frivolous. frivolous. Let's get yeah, to some yeah, serious yeah, discussion. Yeah. S serious things. Um, 
one of the things I, I think that strikes people when, when they hear about your role and, and they see what you are about, that you really are a prestigious woman in data. Would you agree that you are one of the foremost women in data in the UK? Canadians are usually quite shy and humble, um, but I would say I would say it's probably true that I'm one of the foremost women in data regulation. Any other regulators in the room today? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's an amazing privilege to be in this role at this time, and it's an enormous responsibility because data protection, as all of you in this room know, is no longer a back, a back office, back page of the newspaper kind of issue. It's very much a front burner issue, and there's so much change in this field. I'm responsible for going to the mat for UK citizens to ensure responsible use of personal data. And that's across the private sector, it's across the public sector. We're trying to help companies like yours figure out how do you find fairness in machine learning? How do you find a way to be transparent, as the law requires, in algorithmic decision making? How can we figure this out? Well, we need to figure it out together. But I work on behalf of citizens. I enforce the law. The law is changing, as all of you know. We've got a European regulation coming in and our own domestic law. So my job feels a lot like changing a tire on a moving car that's going around the roundabout and is bursting into flames. So that's pretty much what it feels like. Um, but I'm honored and privileged to do the role. Fantastic. Now, can I just ask you, you used an expression there, go to the mat. Is do you that know it? that term? <laughs> go to the mat? It's a wrestling term. I should be using cricket terminology, oh, but yeah. going to the mat is you will go to the ends of the earth for um, citizens and consumers in the UK, and that's, that's my job. That's who I'm sticking up for. And, and how did it come about that you are the UK's information commissioner? Well, funny that you asked that, because when I was in high school and then when I was at university, I didn't say, I want to be an information commissioner, because back then, those roles didn't even exist. So instead of studying data, I studied information. And my graduate studies were in information science and library science. I spent many years as a professional archivist. So what I was doing there is managing neat old stuff and making it accessible and available to the public. So very much, I was a handmaiden of history. How about that? Ah. And my first um, computer science course was back in the day of mainframe computers and punch cards and programming. And uh, my course was called Machine Readable Records. So I have now dated myself. <laughs> but I do think it was a natural transition for me to move from information management to overseeing the ethical and legal use of data. So a, a natural transition. I was 12 years a regulator in Canada, most recently Information and Privacy Commissioner for British Columbia. I was attracted to the UK because of the ICO's amazing reputation of, as being a tech-savvy, important regulator, and I wanted to lead that organization. And, you know, it's like a mid-age mid adventure. <laughs> um, and there may be something in my genes, but three of my four adult children are in uh, data fields and, and data professions. 75% record. Do you want 75%. To, can you tell us a bit about what they're doing? Well, one is a geneticist. My daughter's a geneticist. I have a son who's an app developer in Silicon Valley. He develops health apps. I have a son who's a particle physicist and a son who's a poet. So three of them went <laughs> towards the data side. The other one's doing something else. So. <laughs> Fantastic. And what about special memories that you have of your time as a Canadian regulator. Well, I think I have a photo. Let me do a photo. There we go. 
Okay, so the majority of um, data protection regulators in Canada are women. Yay! And here's a photograph of two women that I would walk over hot coals for. Um, Jennifer Stoddard was the Privacy Commissioner of Canada. I worked for her for many years, amazing mentor. And Jill Clayton, who is a friend and a peer, and she's the Privacy Commissioner of the province of Alberta. We're wearing our hometown hockey, ice hockey, um, jerseys, so I have a Vancouver Canucks sweater on. Anyone heard of the Vancouver Canucks? No? Oh, excellent, a couple of hands are going up. But I think the point is there's very strong collaboration and very, a very good working relationships with regulators across Canada, and we get data protection right. And it may have something to do with the fact that we're trying to find solutions together um, that we've built a really great community. I know you've talked a lot about soft skills here today. I think what I bring to this community in the UK is a desire to work with other regulators, to work with business and industry, to try to find the solutions to balancing innovation and privacy, because that's what it has to be. It's data, innovation, and respect for personal privacy that's going to find us the way forward. And we have a big job to do. Privacy is a team sport, and I'm wearing my team jersey. So that's my special memory. And did you ever play ice hockey? I did in high school, but I, I, was, a, I was a defenseless, defense, I was a defenseless um, uh, lineman. Defense, defense. lineman. <laughs> so how did you find yourself working in data? I've done a lot of talking here, Fidelma. Gosh, I suspect I might be like a lot of people here. It was a teacher way back when I was in school. Yeah, she joined in my final year of school and I can still remember her name, Miss Sheehan. She came in as our science teacher, but she was studying computer science at night and she gave me the bug. Now, I think you and I probably come from the same, same era, same era yeah, of, of training. So in those days, and I definitely am giving my age away, there weren't that many courses in computer science. So the one she was doing at night, I subsequently uh, did at night. But I heard uh, that the banks actually trained people. Hmm. So I joined one of the banks in Ireland. I worked for a year in a branch, then a year as a computer operator. Now, we were talking earlier on about uh, punch cards. Yeah, so I... This really is going to sound very old-fashioned to you guys, but what's the important thing about punch cards when you load them? You have to keep them in, in order, Fidelma. In order, yeah. First day on the job, I was given the bunch of cards. What did I do? I dropped them. I, had, I didn't know they had to be in order, <laughs> so I quickly shuffled them together and hoped nobody would notice and put them in. Everything stopped. So not, not, a, not a great way to start, but um, that was the computing bug. And it very quickly moved into the data bug because I joined the programming team that was rewriting the bank's bookkeeping system. So the system that runs all the core banking right. accounts. Yeah? And I was on the team uh, that was writing the savings accounts program. And you have to prepare to take the names and details for the individual who the account is for. But I quickly discovered that the current account team, the mortgages team, and the lending team were all writing similar programs to capture the same data. And I also, for those in data governance, started talking to people, and we had different definitions for the date, of course, address, and this just didn't make sense to me. And again, please don't laugh too much, but I didn't know in those days how to go about raising that in a way that would have an impact. You didn't have your voice. I didn't have my voice, yeah. I think we can safely say I probably have my voice now, so we're okay. So I moved um, from the bank to an insurance company, and this is where the marketing bug then bit because I worked there with a truly innovative marketing director 
and he and I introduced uh, in insurance in Ireland the first cross-selling uh, of insurance products and we also, and this will sound very surprising to people, in 1988 we introduced the first insurance touch-sensitive quotation system in Europe, but the technology was not quite ready, yeah? So you had to, the programming of it for the spaces for touching had to be very wide just to make sure you got it. I mean, technology now is fantastic. Yeah. And then uh, I moved over here to join Deloitte to look after their CRM system. So is there anything that you miss living in London, leaving Dublin behind? Yeah. What do you miss? I miss the people. Yeah, I miss my family and my friends, but I have two big things going for me. One, Dublin isn't that far away, right? And secondly, technology. So just had a great FaceTime call on Sunday evening with my sister and her husband, and my two nieces are now living here in London. So that is fantastic. That is fantastic. That, that is good. Now the other thing I miss, and I have a photo, slightly different to yours, but that's the other thing I miss. If you haven't been to Ireland, it is beautiful, yeah? And the access to scenery like that, you don't quite get it in London. Yeah. So if there's anyone from the Irish Tourist Board, I'll take my commission later from you. So I would say just a couple of weeks ago, my husband and I did a long weekend visit to Dublin, and it was fantastic. The food, the people, the history. We weren't there to get a tan, but it was, it was a fantastic <laughs> trip, so I absolutely agree. So, but, okay, so that's a really interesting career and all of the moves that you've done, but you've recently started a new role at PwC. Why the move from Barclays to PwC, Fidelma? Oh, yes, and I, a lot of people here will know me as having been with Barclays, and in fact, earlier in the year, I celebrated my 10th anniversary for having started at Barclays. And it was that that sort of was a trigger for thinking, actually, what next for me? And that coincided with me meeting Stuart Room. Uh, Stuart, for those of you who don't know, is a privacy lawyer, and I have had the pleasure of knowing him for a number of years, but also having worked with him, I was his client at one point, and I have huge respect for him. And he was telling me about the multidisciplinary team that he was setting up. So not all lawyers, but people with those skills. You mean he thinks lawyers don't have all the answers? <laughs> well, I was very relieved yeah. to find that. And I have to tell you, both my sisters are lawyers, so they think it's really quite funny that I have also ended up, you could say, yeah working in an area of in a, in a very legally defined legal. profession. So yeah, yeah. what's the longest that you've stayed in any one role? Because you've done a lot of moving around. In I your, have done a bit. Uh, the Barclays role. 10 years. 10 years, 10 months. Yeah. So that was. Um, you know, just thinking about that and the Barclays to PwC change, um, one of the things that was just great for me, and back to your point about this is about collaboration and a team sport, um, the work that I had started at Barclays with your team, yeah, on uh, preparing to educate the UK citizens about GDPR, um, and the fact that Barclays were supportive of that work continuing and going with me, and PwC saying, absolutely, this is something that really must be continued. That was just great. And, and that's a great example of us working together in a collaborative way with business to be able to reach out to the public. So it's a really important initiative because all of us in the room, in the biz, know what the GDPR is, but I think the wider world don't understand that their rights are changing. Yeah, yeah. So just to add a little bit more flesh to that, what it is that industry is doing, and I am supporting the coordination of those industry members, is we're working with Liz's team to look at how most effectively we can actually help your team 
inform the UK public about those changes in the legislation and what it means for them. Yeah, it's a and great initiative it's and happy that you have been carried it, carried it forward and many of you, many of the companies that you work for are supporting this initiative they as are. well. And they're here, I'd say there's quite a few here today and uh, David who you heard on the panel earlier on, David he's a member of what we describe as the hub who is supporting us and, and that's been really great. So yeah. So great partnership. Great partnership. Really important. Um, but as, as partnerships go, what other aspects of those partnerships are important to you as a regulator? Why, why is it so important with businesses? So as I said earlier, good data protection is a boardroom issue. Data protection is not about, it's not an IT issue anymore. It, it really is a reputational issue for organizations. And good business means respectful data privacy and good, solid data governance. Cyber requires that as well, the new cyber threats. All of these issues are encapsulated in the, in the new law that gives consumers new rights and puts new responsibilities on businesses. And, you know, I think for all of you in business, 20 years ago when the current Data Protection Act was passed, the uses of data that we take for granted today were unimaginable. And we all know that there's massive social and economic benefits in the use of data. We know that, right? But we also know that we're not going to be able to exploit the use of data and to use data if we don't take people with us. And if people buy into the use that companies want to make of their data, and if they trust companies and governments with the use of the data, then everybody wins. Communities win, individuals win, and business wins. So the end game for me and the one objective that I've set for my team over the next five years of my term is that we need to improve the public trust and confidence in the use of personal data. So that's why I need partnerships. Our office has just um, started a, a grants program where we fund academics and civil society and private sector organizations to come up with privacy by design solutions. So we have just funded some really interesting projects using anonymization tools, producing open source solutions to help consumers navigate their own privacy rights online. So that's the kind of partnerships that we're really looking for. And if we can work closely with business as we're trying to do, then as I say, we're gonna get to our goal and we're gonna improve the trust that the public have in the use and sharing of their personal data. So I really want to work with businesses to spread that message. That sounded a little bit like a soapbox speech. So I'm going to ask you a question now, Fidelma. Um, so as someone who's worked for large commercial firms across various sectors, what is your experience? And do you think that, the, that businesses are rising to the challenges faced by big data? I do, and I also think they're rising to the opportunities. I think there are still, though, what I would describe as nearly environmental issues that actually stand a little bit in the way of that, because I think that people still are a bit scared of that concept of big data. And I think there are organizations who have embraced the opportunities of big data and have done so in a very responsible way to help people get over that scariness. And in fact, um, there was a transformational point in Barclays that stands out for me. I don't know if any of you have been to the open site called um, Local Insights, My Local Insights. And it's um, a site that uh, Barclays have initiated and launched and what it is basically is anonymized and aggregated data provided in a way to help people understand the area in which they live. So if you visit the site and put in your postcode, what you will get back immediately is a report about 
the financial health and activity. Startup in, businesses, spend. There you go. Yeah, the spend. So whether people are spending on dining out or cars, you know, so all of that. But what the turning point was, if we had spoken with people about big data and said, well, we anonymize, we will aggregate, we will absolutely be careful that no business or any individual can be uniquely identified from the data, it's a bit like until you see it, you don't trust it. Yeah. So immediately people saw my local insights. It, it was a transformational moment. Yeah. And in fact, we have the principles we established there being used now by other organizations. And uh, Ramneet, who you uh, all heard on the panel earlier on, she's one of the team that actually are, you know, doing, uh, applying those processes. Yeah, and I have to fess up. We borrowed one of your phrases for that at Barclays. So the, the, the phrase, I don't know if you've heard of it, but that uh, your team have in the guidance is when you are publishing analytic reports is think about how you will robustly test that no one can be identified, and you called it the motivated intruder test, right. which our analysts at Barclays just loved. Well, imitation is the final uh, form of There you go. Indeed. So we have definitely uh, a predominantly female audience, yeah? They are women in data. I'm glad, by the way, I know they say data is the new oil, so I don't think we should go for women in oil. I think we should stick with the women in data. Yeah, but in data. what do you think, if any, are the barriers to women who want to think about a career in the field of data? Well, I think, and I'm sure you've talked about this today, some of the same barriers exist um, that are there for women in tech. So obviously male-dominated fields of computer science and engineers have really been um, those leaders that advance, have advanced cloud technology and mobile and, and big data and analytics. So these are still, I think, male-dominated fields. Um, so women traditionally have not been leaders in the exploitation of data. Mm -hmm. But I do think that women have been the, the leaders, as I said before, in the safeguarding of data. And I think a combination, a killer combination of skills for the future will be women who are tech savvy and tech talented in the use of data, as well as being able to bring the human side to the data. So how are we going to take people with us in the uses of data? So I think women can get there, can, be, can offer very, very important skills in getting this balance right. And as I said, I think that's a killer combination. Also, I think women in data, data careers don't quite have the same um, glass ceiling as I think some of the tech careers. So I think there's probably more room to maneuver there. Um, but I think that the next generation of data divas might actually be Girl Scouts who can earn um, cyber security badges. I think that would be really cool, a good idea for the future. I love it. <laughs> but from, from your experience, uh, Fidelma, what do you think? You said it earlier in our conversation. Um, do you think things are improving, opportunities are improving? I think they are. I, I think we've heard already that this conference three years, three years ago, yeah, was not anything close to this size. I think what we are What do we seeing, have, 400 people here? It must be. It must yeah. be. 430. 430. Fantastic. Blimey. We'll have to go to Wembley next year, I reckon. <laughs> that, I mean, that's just phenomenal. And when I started my career in the bank, um, myself and another girl, Nora, who I remember very well, um, she and I were the first two females who had been brought through into the programming environment. And it was so unusual that they sent a director down from head office, ta -da, <laughs> To congratulate to you? To congratulate us. I mean, 
just unbelievable. But I think for me, um, what is wonderful is we do have a huge number of young people here who are ready to embrace and hopefully progress through uh, a career in data. And for me, it's back to Ms. Sheehan, yeah? Mm -hmm. We need people right back at the early stages of educating girls to give them the vision, yeah? To help them understand what those opportunities are. For me, data is one of the best roles for women because it is flexible in access. Right. And we've heard again from some of the women here today how it has helped them in a work-life balance. Right. So we need more Ms. Sheehan. We do. <laughs> now, we've, we're embarking on an evolution in data that we've talked about. What about in the regulatory space? Do you think the reforms will be transformational? And what will their impact be on our audience here today? Well, we're talking here about the general data protection <coughs> regulation and the data protection bill that's going through Parliament. So we know about May 25th, 2018, when the world will change. Really, I think it's an evolution, not a revolution in law. It's a step up in terms of rights for individuals. And a lot of it, legislators have made the changes in the law in response to people being concerned and feeling that they've lost control over their personal data. So that's why we have new rights in the law. The right to be forgotten, which is quite controversial. We have um, the right to data portability, which is new. Um, we all want to take our data with us between services. That makes sense. We have um, the right to challenge algorithmic decision making. All of these, this is, a, this is an attempt of the law to keep up with technology. Good luck with that, right? The law never keeps up with technology, but I think what it does do is it provides um, the regulator with new tools and new powers to be able to encourage good compliance with the law. So I have a whole bunch of new regulatory tools in my toolbox in, 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 in terms of fines, in terms of mandatory audits, in terms of requirements to notify our office when, um, when you've had a significant data breach so we don't have to go chasing around to find that stuff out anymore. Um, but I do think that what, this, what the law is really trying to do is to make data protection an integral part of what a business does. It's not a bolt-on extra responsibility that your compliance people have to do. It has to be Respect for individuals has to be embedded in, in marketing, in design of tools, in design of services, respect for your employees. So it's really about making people at the center, be at the center of what you do. And if we get this right, and I think we have a massive opportunity in the UK to get this right, then the prizes are for everybody. They're for a business, they're for individuals, and they're for communities. And that is really going to be the focus of my work over, over the next few years. And with AI and machine learning and big data, we have a challenge on our hands. But working together um, as a team, we can get it done. Super. And, you know, I wholeheartedly embrace those. You go to it, girl. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> get the... Get thee going. So, as a final question for you, Liz, this is a change, and it is about individuals. But for our audience today, a female audience, do you think that there's any specific impact or benefit? Well, I talked about the benefit of what women in data can bring to this field within your companies, or hey, we're hiring, come and work for the regulator. I think there's great opportunity for women in this field. But if you're talking about the law, at the heart of the general data protection regulation and the data protection bill, it's really about the individual and the rights of an individual, regardless of um, sexual preference, race, religion, political beliefs, 
skin color, or gender. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much. Perfect. Thank you, Liz. Great fun. Well done. Thank you, ladies. That was fantastic. Truly, truly brilliant.